Good morning, and welcome to the 23rd anniversary Real Change Breakfast. Whoop, whoop. Uh, my name is Jared Klaus, and I manage the vendor program, but for this morning, I will also be your MC. You're welcome. Uh, um, thank you all for being here bright and early uh, to celebrate all things Real Change. It's a really awesome day and I'm gr glad you can all be part of it. We have some great news that all the costs associated with putting on the event have been covered by our incredible sponsors. So all the donations made today go directly to uh, the programs and services provided. Please give me a moment to thank the, the, the sponsors that made that reality possible. Gunther Creative, Downtown Emergency Service Center, Facing Homelessness, the Northwest Immigrant Rights Project, the Central Co-op, Plymouth Housing Group, <laughs> Social Justice Fund, the Public Defenders Association, the Washington Low Income Housing Alliance, the YWCA of Seattle, King, and Snohomish, Low Income Housing Institute, the Pacific Northwest Regional Council of Carpenters, UFCW Local 21, Seattle King County Coalition on Homelessness, Community Alliance for Global Justice, and Companis. Thank you all. But there's more. There's more, really. It's exciting. Uh, our in-kind sponsors include the Northwest Trophy, Dylan Priest Photography, Mike McCormick Videography, and Cafe Vida. And last but not least, our matching sponsor this morning is the Lucky Seven Foundation. So any donation made of $250 or more will be matched. In addition, you will also be receiving a, a copy of our keynote speaker, Eric Liu's book, You're More Powerful Than You Think, and a Real Change Resist t-shirt while supplies last. You better run. Uh, also this morning, I'd like to introduce you to a new program that we are launching uh, in, in, uh, together with local labor unions. It's called the Vendor Solidarity Project and alongside with local unions, labor unions, we are putting together visibility vests for all of our vendors so that they can increase their sales. The vest will have the union logo on it as well as real change. And if for anyone who's in sales knows, increased visibility means more money in the pockets of vendors as well as more readers and more people organizing in our community for change. So this is a huge uh, deal and a big thank you to UFCW Local 21. Without you, this would not have happened. And, uh, and if you represent a union or would like to get involved, please contact Camilla. Uh, at Real Change. At this time, I'd like to introduce uh, our uh, talented and brilliant uh, volunteer manager, Jen Romo, to introduce the Volunteers of the Year. Thanks, Jared. Like Jared said, I'm Jen Romo. I'm the volunteer manager. Working with Real Change volunteers these past few years has been such an honor, and I'm glad to be able to give our Volunteer of the Year award to two amazing folks this morning, Alex Garland and Pamela Bradburn. But first, let's give it up for the volunteers who woke up early this morning to set up and welcome you to this space. They're in the back lobby, so clap loudly. Alex Garland couldn't be with us this morning, but I still want to share what an amazing person he is. You've probably seen Alex's photography over the years, uh, whether it's in Real Change or another publication. He also has a website called The Dignity Virus that you should check out if you haven't already. Alex has been taking photos for the paper for, since 2012 and has contributed over 50 uh, photos to the paper over the last five years. He's well known for his focus on documenting protests and political action and has a remarkable way of being at just the right place at just the right time. Alex's photos of Standing Rock, which you see here, were published in Real Change last September. 
This work both won both a regional and an international award. We're, incre we're incredibly lucky to have such a talented, passionate photojournalist on our team. Thanks, Alex. Next, I'd like to bring up Pamela Bradburn. Pamela, do you want to come on up? I'm excited to be able to give Pamela this award. Pamela got started on her newspaper sales desk in early 2014, and shortly thereafter began copy editing the newspaper. For the past three years, Pamela has spent her Monday afternoons with us, selling newspapers to vendors and editing the paper one right after another. In all, she's served just under 700 hours volunteering in these two roles and many others. She's reliable and well-liked by our vendors, and I particularly appreciate how flexible she is when a volunteer shift needs to be rescheduled. Pamela, I'm grateful to you for your consistency, your thoughtfulness, and your generosity with our vendors. You're a pleasure to work with, and I'm glad to name you one of our Volunteers of the Year. Good morning. I've been asked to share with you why I volunteer at Real Change. First of all, Tim Harris asked me to. <laughs> Those of you who know him or have even heard about him know that Tim is a force of nature. So I said, sure, how about every other week? Tim said, every week. <laughs> so as Jen said, I have been there every Monday afternoon since. I happen to have a particular weird, picky kind of mind. And when I heard that there was a proofreader position open, I begged Jen to let me try it. And so I have been proofreading um, the next issue at the end of each of my Monday afternoon shifts. I've only been able to do this from the, because of the generosity of Wes Browning, who writes the Dr. Wes columns you all love. He fills out the last hour of my vendor shift, allowing me to go do this other thing that I love to do. And finally, I am humbled and awestruck by the people who sell the newspaper. They face, yes. They face so many obstacles and difficulties, and yet they have the outrageous hope that they can make their lives better. And many of them do. So why should you consider volunteering for real change? Well, you'll be needed and appreciated every volunteer shift, every volunteer activity that I do, I am thanked by a member of the staff. All your skills will be used and your hearts and lives will be expanded by the wonderful staff members and vendors you work with. Thank you very much. Thanks, Pamela. And now I'd like to present our board president, Jim Lowinger. Thank you, Jen, and good morning, everybody. I am here to fill in for our founding director, Tim Harris. Tim, wave your hand. Don't stand up, just wave your hand. Tim has been uh, dealing and recovering from uh, an unexpected surgery with his eyes and so we we're kind of keeping him quiet this morning this is the first time in 23 years that we're not allowing you to say anything is that right bad a bad a bad thing to try and substitute for but uh, Tim we're indebted to you for all that you've done for real change 
in the past 23 years and bringing us all together again. Thank you. One of the real powers behind real change is our active board of directors, which I am pleased and honored to be the president of. So I'd like to take a moment to recognize my board. And if I, when, I, when I say your name, if you just stand up and remain standing, and at the end, this large, incredible group is going to give you an overwhelming ovation. Yolanda Altamirano. It's already getting overwhelming, isn't it? Malou Chavez. Shelly Cohen. Yasin Darmulo. Anitra Freeman. Chris Janice. Matthew Echohawk Hayashi. David Herning. Anna Hunthausen. Maria Elena Ramirez. Teresa Reeves. Anne Chakundi Salisbury. Thank you all for the hard work, all of the hours, for your support and putting up with me. Thank you. I'd like to also thank two people in the audience this morning who have given so much to real change over the last numbers of years. Alan Preston, sitting over here in front. Alan, if you'd stand. Alan. Alan has stepped down this year as the managing director after eight years of serving Real Change with his vision, his leadership, and his dedication to the Real Change mission. Thank you, Alan. Tara Moss. I saw Tara earlier, so Tara, would you stand up? Oh, right there. Okay, you were over here then. Tara Moss first joined Real Change as a volunteer and then as a staff member in 2009. Her eight years, in her eight years, Tara rebuilt the vendor program, shaped the vision of our organization, and built a caring future that embodies Real Change today. She took her career all the way to a director of operations for Real Change and now with her recent move to the Public Defender Association as Project Director of LEAD. Congratulations and good luck to you for your continued success. Now I have the pleasure of presenting our 2017 Change Agent Award to someone who has demonstrated outstanding leadership and organizing efforts on the issues that directly impact the lives of our community members. Patricia Sully's work through Voices of Community Activists and Leaders, Vocal Washington, has covered housing, homelessness, war on drugs, mass incarceration, incarceration, and the HIV AIDS epidemic. Patricia lives her life as a catalyst for change and is working in collaboration with Real Change on creating safe consumption sites, police accountability, and many other action campaigns. Please join me in congratulating Patricia Sully for her outstanding organizing efforts. Thank you all, and now I will turn it back over to Jared. Thank you. Now for the time we've all been waiting for, the Vendor of the Year Awards. This is particularly exciting for me as the vendor manager, where at a moment where we get to uh, recognize just some of the vendors that make real change the place we know and love. I'd like to recognize the eight finalists. Uh, we only have two vendors of the year, but these are the eight finalists that vendors voted on. All of them 
uh, represent real change values of courage, community, community, creativity, compassion, and integrity. And when you're competing with roughly 800 other vendors, it's amazing just to be, get to this point as well. So nominees, as I read your name, will you please stand so we could recognize you? Donald Moorhead, Evie Mason, Harlan Wood, Jen Tibbetts, Sarah Burnham, Sean Wilson, Tanika Faircloth, and Yamani Burr. Thank you. Now to introduce you to the 2017 Vendors of the Award, I will direct your attention to the screen closest to you to watch a video that was uh, made by Dylan Priest, who donated his time and resources to introduce you all to our 2017 Vendors of the Year. My name is Donald Moorhead and I do Ad Real Change. Uh, I sell papers and I do orientation. I just uh, basically show the new vendors uh, the rules and regulations and how it's done. You know, I give them a little insight on how it's done because I, I saw a lot of vendors through the years, you know, they knew uh, of the paper, but they didn't know, they didn't really know how to sell the paper. And thinking about back then when I went through orientation was one of the reasons when they say we need somebody to do orientation, I'm like, that's my cue right there. That's my chance to help some of these vendors. You know, I can change the outlook on the way vendors are going about selling their papers. And my attitude might rub off on, on this person, and then they rub off on the next person, and rub off on the next person. That's what I was looking at. That was the goal I was trying to succeed in. I saw up in Ballot since I got here, so uh, what's that? 17 years. I know a lot of the people that's, that I didn't, I didn't got to know, you know, and that's, that's, I guess that's why I'm still selling paper because it helps me interact with people more and to go outside more because for a while I would uh, not go outside much unless it's possible, you know, and I'd be frustrated all day or, or depressed, I, I stopped letting that bother me like that, you know, and that's what real change do for me. I've learned to overlook the bad in people and try to see the good. I came a long way. Well, it's good when somebody acknowledges it, that uh, you're, you're trying to do something, I, it feels good to, to see that somebody appreciate it, you know? It lets me know that, yeah, I'm, I'm making some type of a difference. My help, my helping out here running orientation has has really made a difference. I'm proud of, of what I've done so far, and I hope to, to keep on doing uh, what I'm doing. And helping vendors out uh, has has really helped me to help myself. You know, and I see that now that I'm I'm helping them to help themselves too. And that's basically what I really want to do. I'm making a, a difference in this world. I'm I'm here for a purpose. My name is Jen Tibbetts. I am a vendor at Real Change. I have been for about two and a half years. I've been a vendor rep twice, which is a six month term. Uh, I have been the vendor intern, which is an 11 month term. And I currently sit on the vendor leadership board as the vice president. Well, I found out about Real Change when I was very young from a, a vendor that um, worked in the U District, but I never really thought much of it until I was at Labor Ready and they had some qualms about sending me out. So one of the guys that working at, at Labor Ready, he told me I should come down and there was actually going to be an orientation, uh, probably, I don't know, an hour from when he was talking to me. So I just came down here and I did the orientation and I made a decent amount of money my first day. And more recently, I have been selling in front of Benna Royal Hall. Uh, I get to make my own hours, and that's a really big thing for me because I have some medical conditions that I never know when I can work and when I can't. Uh, I can usually make sure that I'm at work once or twice a week, but I've been able to hold down this job, make enough money to where I can go and do fun things instead of 
you know, scrounging for, you know, whatever I need, including a place to stay for the night. I came in first as a vendor and then um, Jared kept telling me that I should do this, I should do that, kept throwing papers in my face to fill out, going, you should do this, you should do this. <laughs> so finally I came in, I'm like, okay, here, sign. <laughs> and it was one of the best things I ever did. As the vice president of the vendor leadership board, I, I feel like I really have a much bigger voice here. And I can, you know, when the vendors talk to me, because they know me as a vendor rep, even though I'm not one now, they tend to talk to me about a lot of things that they don't always take to the staff. And this position allows me to make their voices heard. When they told me that I got vendor of the year, I was pretty excited, because I did not think I was gonna get it, but I guess people like me. Yeah, it, it does bring me joy, and I'm very happy doing it. As a matter of fact, I think I'm happier when I'm in the office not getting paid than when I'm out on the corner trying to sell my papers. I mean, I, I can honestly say that, that some of the people who work here, like at Real Change, non-vendors, are some of my closest friends. Please join me in welcoming to the stage the two seven, 2017 Vendors of the Year, Donald Moorhead and Jen Tibbetts. First of all, I'd like to thank Jen and Camilla for all their hard work in making this such a great event. I'm sure you all think so. <laughs> uh, also, thank you all for being here. Also, I'd like to thank Aaron, our editor, for the great job that he's doing and all of his hard work. <laughs> Finally, I'd like to thank Neil and Jared for always being there for us, and Jared especially for pushing me to do more and to be more in all that I do. One of my mentors has a saying. He says, your face, a lot. Yes. <laughs> Usually in a context that doesn't make much sense. But it's always funny because he likes to make people laugh. <laughs> it makes me think about all the faces that I see every day. If you look around the room at all the faces, you'll see they're all the same. No matter where one comes from, their heritage, their living status, or the way one chooses to live, it's all one face, the human face. Donald? Hello. I'd like to thank, uh, I'd like to thank, uh, hold on. I'd like to thank Tim, Tim Harris, Jerry Klaus, uh, I just call him Paul Allen, but it's Allen. <laughs> How you doing, Alex? And and my team, because without my team, uh, I wouldn't be here today. And um, Lindsay Spark Plug, I call it Spark Plug. Um, just for the record, this award is not for uh, selling the most papers of the year. It's not that. It's just for the achievements that that uh, we accomplished while in the office. So I just wanted to make that clear because a lot of people are, are coming to me saying, uh, uh, congratulations on selling the most papers. Uh, I don't sell the most papers. <laughs> I'm far from that. 
So I just wanted to make that clear. And uh, uh, also, Miss um, Johnson, Mr. and Mr. Johnson, and Mr. and Mr. Kowalski, um, uh, I just wanted to say, yeah, um, but what's, what's more important to me was, is to just, uh, my daughter just graduated from college and my son is on his way. Yeah. Uh, Uh, she, they asked me, uh, what could you do? I just uh, would like to go see them. That's it. So, thank you. Congratulations, Donald and Jen. They're, they're also my biggest critic, so I'm really nervous. Uh, at this point, there's good news and bad news. Uh, the bad news is someone stole my notes. The good news is I know what comes next. Um, so at this point, I'd like to introduce Reverend Rich Lang, who's been a longtime columnist and is the superintendent of something important around here. So, <laughs> Richard Lang. Ah, yes, those who say the church is dying, yes, yes. You know, I'm 61 years old, and, um, and I grew up in times greatly different from today. Um, my mom and dad were both factory workers, but we were blessed in those days with strong unions who had bolstered their paychecks so that I grew up in a, in a functional working class neighborhood that basically covered all my everyday needs. I was able to attend um, um, decent high schools or decent schools all the way through. Um, I had a home life that despite uh, multiple divorces still gave me enough stability to graduate from high school and to be the, the only one in a family of four to go to college. Um, I literally am part of that, you know, kind of American dream of ascending into the high middle class. Um, it's, a, it's a world that um, allows me considerable enough surplus that I can own a home. I can contribute to a pension. I have health care. I can take vacations. Thank you, Rick Stevens, or Rick Steves uh, European tours. And I come here today capable of doing some good through the good fortune of my life. Now, growing up, not everything was roses. Divorce, multiple divorces, alongside a family fighting and alcoholism, I think, as we all know, can do a number on a child's interior stability and self-esteem. I did go to decent schools, but I barely graduated with a 1.89 grade point average kicked out of high school four times in four years. I, I, no. <laughs> I'm paid for it later. Um, I was, as they say, a troubled child. However, given the same parents and the same situation today, I think my life would be radically different. No doubt, dad would have gone from job to job increasing in his frustration and in his alcoholism and in his rage. Mom would have been downsized long before I got to school. The neighborhoods we would have lived in would have been far more impoverished, and I would not be standing before you as a well-paid professional. But with any luck, maybe I would have found real change and could stand before you like Donald or Jim and someone who has made a difference. What I'm saying is this. I grew up in a time of supportive infrastructure. One could fall and even fail and get back up again and do a redo. And it helped, of course, that I was white and male. But today is different. The infrastructure that I'm talking about is gone. And even white males are learning what it is to be rejected by a world far more disconnected and often heartless. Real change is, in my opinion, the best infrastructure 
for poor and struggling people today. It not only puts out a quality product, but of even more importance, it offers those who are trying to get back up an opportunity to achieve, to redevelop self-respect. It provides the opportunity to hope again, and it offers a stable neighborhood, stable network of friends and supporters who know your name, who care for you, and who over and over again share life with you, indeed who love you back into abundant life. I have met the most amazingly courageous people through knowing real change vendors. Whether it's Todd, who I met when he was sleeping in his car 18 years ago, absolutely alone, no family, no friends, mentally ill, without friends or stability, scared and frightened, but who is today housed. He still struggles, but not alone. He's not without hope. He hasn't been abandoned by those around him. Todd, who was living in hell, knows a way out of hell. Or Sharon, whose income allows her to share an apartment with an aging mom, a mom who without her daughter wouldn't have enough to pay her rent. And this same courageous Sharon is free from those drug demons. She's free from thinking herself worthless, free from despair. And what freed her? It started with real change. And it deepened because she was accepted and cared for. It deepened further um, with constant encouragement from the Real Change staff and her clients to keep getting clean, to keep getting sober, to keep staying healthy. That's what I mean by infrastructure. That's the magic. All of it built upon and through relationships. This is the stuff of life, of abundant life, of real change. This is what works to bring a person back from the dead. This is what works to reanimate life. And I can tell you about um, Yamani. Is he here? Hey, Yamani. Yamani. Yamani is, I met him in the U District. And he just anchored the corner that he sold his papers on. And when he was gone, the whole neighborhood missed him. I can tell you how inwardly strong he is, how he brings happiness to others, how he loves his family and supports them even though they live on the other side of the world. That's courage. That's integrity. That's a man who's living for purpose. I could tell you about Dennis, the hardest working man I know. I can tell you about Mike, an unbelievable cook. Or Dave, who should have gone into stand-up comedy. Or Rocket, who has the best jump shot I've ever seen. These were all once strangers who sold a paper, who I've gotten to know, and now friends who I've gotten to love. That's why I'm here today. That's why I'm doing the ask. <laughs> I've been working alongside homeless and struggling people throughout all of my years in Seattle, and I know, I don't believe, I don't hope, I absolutely know that the networks and the infrastructure, the relationships, and absolutely, yes, the jobs, that real change provides, changes lives, and does an awesomely fantastic, powerful resurrection in the lives of those who are walking through the valley of the shadow of death. And so yes, I'm here to ask us all to raise the bar, to do a miracle, and to give outrageously to real change. And so this is the cue for you wonderful table captains to hand out those pens Dig deep in your pocket. No, and donation forms to the gang around your table. But before you fill them out, just give me another minute. Before you fill them out, this room, if you look around, is full of good people. That's why we're here. Something that we all have in common is that we're givers. We believe in infrastructure. We believe in building networks. We believe in including everybody in the neighborhood. I'm not here to ask you to give. You already do that. I'm here to ask you to give more. If you're like me, you have your donation in mind. Or like any good vacation gambler in Vegas, you've already set a limit so you don't gamble away the sacred nest egg. 
So let's say you've brought a $100 gift, and that's fantastic because 10 of us together means $1,000. And 100 of us together means $10,000. But I do want to challenge you to go up to $250 because we do have that major donor, the Lucky 7 Foundation, who will meet every one of those gifts up to $15,000, which means you can double your gift. If a hundred of us gave $250, that would jump up to a total of $25,000. Now, my schooling wasn't good, so I looked that up on Google. <laughs> you add the $15,000, we're talking $40,000. We're starting to talk about something that can make an impact. And you also get a copy of Eric Liu's book and the fabulous resist t-shirt that had Tim been healthy, I was going to offer to do a strip tease with him until we raised enough money to get the whole thing uh, together. Now some of you already have that t-shirt. If you could stand up, you just, if you've got it, stand up. <gasps> Nobody's got it. Okay. Uh, if you already have, okay. Just, just want to let you know it's really out there. Um, but I want to go further. What if a hundred of us gave a thousand dollars? That's 83 bucks a month. That's less than one good night on the town. And yet together as a neighborhood network, that would be $100,000. That's doing some real good through the real good fortune of our life. And that's why we're here. It's to build a solid infrastructure for real change. We want folks to have jobs. We want to build a city of love and care. We want to show the world because we live in a global city, that there is a better way. We want life, abundant life, a life filled with gratitude and generosity, a life overflowing with courage and lived with kindness. We want to end homelessness and poverty, and we want to minimize suffering and sorrow, and we want this because we ourselves have come to see that our own goodness was built through others who cared for us. And we know without doubt that every single person belongs. So thank you for giving outrageously to Real Change, the best organization in this city. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Rich. Uh, and a reminder to give that envelope that's now full of money to your table captain. Just make sure that happens. Thank you. Uh, so as you know, uh, Real Change is more than just an incredible vendor program uh, that employs over 800 vendors annually and puts over a million dollars into the pockets uh, every year. We also build community and affect change through organizing and advocacy. We build change through grassroots activism by engaging our community on the issues that matter. Our keynote speaker today shares that vision of change. Eric Liu is the founder and CEO of Citizen University and executive director of the Aspen Institute Citizenship and American Identity Program. He is the author of several books, including You're More Powerful Than You Think, A Citizen's Guide to Making Change Happen, Eric served as a White House speechwriter and policy advisor for President Bill Clinton. He is a regular columnist for CNN.com and a correspondent for TheAtlantic.com. Please join me in welcoming to the stage our keynote speaker, Eric Liu. Thank you very much, Jared. And uh, let's uh, again congratulate our vendors of the year. Jan and Donald, and congratulate uh, everybody here. I really, um, I'm not even sure what I'm doing up here uh, after hearing Reverend Rich. Uh, he, he pretty much said it all and said it really well. Uh, but uh, like Reverend Rich, actually, uh, I also wanted to open uh, by acknowledging somebody in the room, and that is uh, Yamani. Uh, where are you, Yamani? Right here. So Yamani, uh, who uh, you may have noticed was one of the eight uh, finalists for Vendor of the Year, um, is real change to me. Uh, and I, uh, most Fridays uh, in the summertime, uh, Yamani, we, we, uh, 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 he's not in the U District, he's down in the Madrona Farmer's Market. And, uh, uh, and I see him at the Farmer's Market, and the conversations that we've had over the weeks, over the months, over the years, um, make this institution 
what it is. And what this institution is, as Rich was saying, is not just a newspaper, it's not just a publication, it's not just even a vehicle for community empowerment. It is an embodiment of a faith in the possibility of resurrection. It is an embodiment of the possibility that people who are confronted with hard times and hard realities can power through those hard times and hard realities and make a new life. Yamani has done that. Yamani, selling papers at the uh, farmer's market there, came to know somebody who ended up offering him a job. And between the work of selling papers, which he continues to do as a vendor, and working in the community, he's been able to rebuild a life and able to reconnect in different ways with family, as Reverend Rich said, halfway on the other side of the world. So, Yamani, you stand in for not just uh, your fellow nominees and finalists for Vendor of the Year, but for the spirit of what this whole endeavor is. And I'm really honored to be here and to honor you, Yamani. I am... Um, as, as, uh, as you heard a moment ago, I run an organization based here in Seattle. We do work all around the country, and it's a nonprofit called Citizen University. And all of our work at Citizen University really boils down to the simple idea of teaching power, democratizing an understanding of how power works in everyday civic life, right? How things get done, how decisions get made, not just policy and government and legislation, but who runs this town? Right? Who runs this town? Or to boil it down even further, who decides? Because the question at the very heart of all civic power is, at the end of the day, who decides? Who decides whether this ought to be a community that ends up becoming San Francisco or Manhattan Junior, just for the super privileged, super tech connected, and so forth? Who decides whether it's going to be that or actually an inclusive place? that creates opportunity for everybody? Who decides whether this is going to be a place where we define our value to the world by the values of home properties within the precincts of this city? Who decides that? Who decides whether this is a place where it's just going to be okay to accept and tolerate a certain measure of homelessness? Because that's life, and that's life in boom times. Some people get left behind. Who decides that? Who decides that there's a certain measure of, you know, rough and tumble that you have to accept from the police as the price for order? Who decides that? The answer, of course, is we decide. And when you recognize that it's not some distant they, well, they decided that the law ought to be this. They decided that panhandling ought to be punished this way. They decided that housing ought to be made less affordable. But there is no they, especially at the scale of a city. Right? The scale of the city where you can pretty much, in a town like Seattle, even though it's growing, it's still fundamentally a small town where you can build relationships and where you are woven into this weave of relationship and obligation. There is no they, it's only we. It's only us. Right? And the only question when it comes to what we're doing is, are we actually showing up? Now, I'm preaching to the converted here because you showed up <laughs> at 7 a.m. this morning. But... I think part of the power of this gathering and the reason why Real Change doesn't just do an online appeal, well, doesn't only do an online appeal, doesn't just send out mailers or ask vendors to ask for money, is that there is power in us looking at each other in this room. I mean, just take a look around for a second at the beauty and the power and the breadth and the diversity and the spirit in this room, right? We see each other. And our work at Citizen University is trying to remind folks that even in this age of profound, radical, severe inequality, levels not seen in the United States since before the Great Depression, right? even in a time like this where people are drifting into this scarcity mentality, this fear that they can't keep up, this fear that because they can't keep up, they've got to hoard what they've got, that even in a time like this, we see each other and that our ability to see each other just the same way that vendors see us and we see vendors, that we humanize each other every single day, we interact with real change, the community, that teaching other people how to see this way is a great source of our power. Well, 
in this book that I know many of you are going to be getting because many of you made gifts just now of more than $250 to real change. In this book of mine called You're More Powerful Than You Think, I talk about what power is in civic life. And I define power very simply. I define it as a capacity to ensure that others do as you would like them to do. All right? And some people kind of nervously chuckling there because that's kind of a menacing, evil sounding definition, right? I'm going to lord it over you. I'm going to dominate you. I'm going to make you do what I want you to do. But if we are honest with ourselves, at every turn, at every scale of relationship in our lives, with our loved ones, with our neighbors, with strangers on the street, with coworkers, whatever it might be, with our elected officials, we are always trying to get others to do as we would like them to do. We're not always candid about it, but we always are. And that capacity, when it's applied to questions of common concern, of public interest, is what you can think of as civic power. Right? I'm not just talking about getting what you can for yourself to get a promotion or to get a little better treatment in your community, whatever it might be. I'm talking about power in the collective. Well, there are three laws of power that I talk about in this book and that I wanted to kind of name here because it turns out they're all relevant to the challenges that we're facing here as members of the Real Change family. And these three laws actually also yield three imperatives for action. That real change is, by my lights, one of the best instantiations of to be found in the country. So let me tell you these three laws. The three laws are simply these. Law number one of power in civic life. Power concentrates. It compounds. Right? And that is as true as human nature and as old as history. Those who have get more. The rich get richer. People with clout get more clout. People who get named and in the media get more coverage in the media. That is the nature of systems, but especially in a time of great inequality like this. You feel it. And of course, powerlessness compounds as well. The more mar marginalized you are, the more systems and society pushes you out further to the margins. That's law number one. And we feel it in this age. I can cite you statistics about the level of inequality and the way in which the share of national income that's gone to the 1% has tripled in the last generation from 8% to over 20%. Right? Imagine if 20% of the blood in my body was in my pinky. Right? Just this ballooning thing of blood in my pinky. Y you would look at me and you'd say, dude, you're sick. <laughs> and I would try to answer, but I'd pretty much not be able to because I would be collapsing and dying right there. Right? That is the compounding situation we're in. So that's law number one. Law number two is that power justifies itself at every turn. Incumbent holders of power, whether they are individuals or institutions, are always spinning elaborate narratives about why it ought to be that way. Right? Why this is the nature of things. Why it is a God-given nature of things. Now, there was a day in other societies where it was literally a matter of things being claimed to be God-given. And kings and emperors said, you know, I get the throne because I am the son of God. Right? Or I'm lineally de de descended from God. And they base their claims to power on divine right. And, you know, we in the 21st century in the United States can kind of chuckle at that. Can you believe there were people in societies once who believed in this superstitious notion that people were descended from God and therefore got to be king or emperor? And yet, here today in 2017, here in Seattle, there are people who subscribe deeply, even if unwittingly and unconsciously, they subscribe deeply to a philosophy of what you might think of as economic royalism economic divine right. I'm a job creator. I'm, I'm, I'm a rich guy. I'm a job creator. I'm descended from God. Step off. Stop trying to tax me. Stop trying to regulate me. Stop trying to infringe upon my liberty. If you mess with me and start raising my taxes, I'm warning you, I might not let my prosperity leak down to the rest of you. Right? That is a narrative of self-justification that is in the air at all times. We heard it in this town when, we, when some of us in this room were part of the body that pushed and successfully got our city to adopt a $15 minimum wage. wage. <clears throat> by, by the way, I think that was a kind of a nice Freudian slip. Uh, <laughs> minimum wage is actually, a, $15 is sort of the baseline you ought to get mad if it's less than $15, right? 
And, and we haven't even really acknowledged yet the theme of our gathering here today, people, people's rising, right? But this idea that there's a story of self-justification, trickle-down economics is one such story. White supremacy is another such story. And there are still people all around us, in our communities, in our families, in this country today, who think, dude, why are you talking about history? White supremacy is a thing of the past. Why do you keep on stirring up trouble? Right? That itself is part of a narrative of self-justification that we have to name and then puncture. So if all you had were these first two laws, that power is always compounding and power is always justifying itself, you'd be stuck in a pretty grim doom loop, right? Situation where fewer and fewer people are getting more and more of everything and then telling you why you should be happy about it. What saves us from that doom loop is law number three, and it is this. Power is infinite. Power is infinite. Now, I know some of you, like, that, that's, it's, you're struggling with that. It cuts against some of your intuitions, right? Let me say what I don't mean. I don't mean that, you know, you can just by manifesting it make yourself as wealthy as you possibly would like to be. I don't mean that just wishing that you were powerful and had clout will make it so. But what I do mean is this, that it is entirely possible, and real change is living proof of this, it is entirely possible in civic life to generate brand new power where it did not previously exist through the magic act of organizing. <clears throat> organizing is that magic act that completely generates power out of thin air, right? And our intuitions, we, we struggle with this because our intuitions are derived maybe from physics in the physical world, right? Physics teaches us that if someone in this closed system, and someone in this room gets some more heat or energy, someone else has to get less. Because that's, you know, law of thermodynamics, conservation of energy, right? It's a zero-sum deal. And that's physics. But the thing is, I'm not talking physics. I'm talking civics. And in civics, you can, as our vendors do every day, generate new power by organizing, by building trust, by building relationships, by finding voice, by asserting and claiming and embodying agency. And when they generate new power like that, they didn't make me any less powerful. They didn't take any clout away from our elected officials. They didn't reduce the amount of income that our wealthiest citizens earn every year. All they did was added to the net amount of power circulating in this ecosystem. This idea that power is infinite is so fundamental, and yet, even in times like ours, where people are rising and awakening, it is so easily overlooked. And so, each of these three laws yields three imperatives for action. And real change stands for these imperatives. So, if in the first place, power is always compounding and concentrating into these winner-take-all, monopolized games, our first imperative is simply to change the game. And real change changes the game every single day in which members of our community who may not have homes, who may have low incomes, who may have living situations that are tenuous are saying, I am a business owner. I'm a contributor to community. I am part of the glue of this corner in Ballard or Madrona or Queen Anne or whatever it might be. I own this joint. If in the second place, power is always justifying itself and spinning these narratives about why it is that those who have, have, and those who have not, have not, well then our second imperative is to change the story. And my God, that's what real change is for, right? Both every time you open the pages of real change, you realize the storyline has shifted for you the ways in which the vendors and others in the community are giving themselves voice in the pages of this paper. And then as well, something that we haven't even heard about today, the Homeless Speakers Bureau that Real Change has created, in which members of this community, of this vendor community, are going to organizations, churches, community groups, chambers of commerce, rotary clubs, you name it, to talk about their lives and their experience, to humanize the experience of living in hard times in a hard city. That's changing the story. And then finally, though, if power is infinite, 
And yet so many people are stuck in this zero-sum, finite mindset, the sense that the equation is rigged against them at all times, then our imperative finally is to change the equation of power. And this is something that I think real change does so masterfully in ways that perhaps those of you who en engage with it mainly in print may not fully appreciate. Jen talked about being a member of the Vendor Organizing Committee. Vendor Organizing Committee, this leadership committee that has been advocating in, a, in building cross-class coalitions to advocate for low-income people and homeless people in this community. This committee that has been advocating successfully for things like what was a bill and now is a law, the Fair Chance Housing Law in our city. So that having had a criminal record on your, in your past would not be a bar to employment. You'll see on your tables, actually, another thing that this community has been organizing and activating on, and that is a sheet to collect signatures for Initiative 940, De-Escalate Washington. If you don't know yet what De-Escalate Washington is, ask a neighbor at your table. Ask your table captain. De-Escalate Washington is an initiative that is going to require that law enforcement get training in the de-escalation of conflict, get training in mental health care, get training in handling situations that don't result in the use of deadly force, and that we even change the standards of conduct of when force is justifiable. So put your names on that sheet, because our vendors are organizing us right now. They change the equation. So this work of changing the game, changing the story, and changing the equation of power is what real change is all about and what every one of the vendors who we've met and heard from today embody for us. But what I want to close with is this. It's a little less concrete than some of these things that real change is doing in the community. It's more of a mindset shift that I want to invite all of us to make as we head out from this breakfast and go back into our daily lives and our work and whatever it might be. And that is a way of thinking about power. I assert, I assert that power is not some evil force. It is not some inherently dirty thing. Right? Power in civic life is, is like fire. It just is. Right? Fire can be used for good or for evil, depending on whether you know how to master it and direct it toward heating a shelter toward preparing food or toward making incendiary weapons, toward turning it into the explosive charge of a firearm. Fire just is. It's on us to determine whether it's good or evil. But another way of thinking about power is this. Power is a gift. Power is a gift, and I mean this in three ways. I mean in the first place in a way that I would pay some homage to Reverend Rich, it is a gift in that whatever your faith tradition or spiritual sense might be, if any, to quote a document in this country, we are endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights. And that is a gift, that endowment. As humans, we are endowed with a sense of dignity. We are endowed with a sense of agency. We are endowed with a right to be seen. That was a gift that we were born with. It is a gift also in the sense that when you talk about people as gifted, you're a gifted artist, you're a gifted athlete, you're a gifted dancer, you're a gifted healer. And when we say that somebody's gifted, what we mean is not only that they have a talent, but what we mean is they shouldn't hoard that talent. <laughs> right? That the point of having that talent is to circulate it and to share it and to show everybody else what it means to paint, and to heal, and to run, and to build. But the third and the final sense in which power is a gift is simply this. We give it. We give our power away at all times. And the reality of civic life in America is that most of us, most of the time, are unthinking and unwitting about how much we are giving away our power. And if there's one thing I want to say to you is, stop throwing it away. Our vendors teach us this. The real change vendors, the real change community teach us this. They waste not their power. They do not throw it away heedlessly. They think about how they want to spend it. They think about how they want to circulate it. But nor do they hoard what power they have. Right? What, they are, what they are engaged in 
is a constant circulation, a constant gift exchange of power. When you buy a paper for two bucks, the cost, I mean, I hate to break it to you, the cost of printing that particular issue of real change was not two dollars, right? You are making a gift. And yet, when that vendor sells it to you, they are making a gift as well. They are making a gift in sharing their dignity, their agency, their voice, and reminding you of yours. Exercising this power and this capacity for agency. What this is at the end of the day, what real change embodies and represents, is an exchange, a gift exchange of humanity. And so today, I want to thank all of you for coming, for showing up, for being part of this community and this family, and not just for giving, but also receiving. And I want to thank again, in closing, the vendors, the people on the street whose courage, whose perseverance, whose persistence, joyful persistence, is a model for all of us on how to live like truly powerful citizens. Thank you very much. <clears throat>